Our reading from Scripture this morning is taken from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. And we are reminded that we are the children of the light. And as we hear this, the word, we remember the great privilege we have of being the light of the world. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to the Fa God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Mike, for reading that. I love all 20 of those verses very much. Today, we're going to focus just on three of them, verses 15, 16, and 17. Let's come before God, let's continue in prayer. Father God, we ask and pray that your spirit work in us, that we grow to make the most of every opportunity that you have given us. And we pray this in your precious name. Amen. A long, long time ago... Many years BC, with BC standing for before the constraint of marriage. I mean, <clears throat> before the completeness of marriage. A long time ago, many years BC, I set out on a very long road expedition with a friend. We headed to Karajini. We did a lot of youthfully, foolhardy driving on very remote outback tracks, doing some even more foolhardy exploits with the climbing that we did. The things that we were, uh, did were likely foolhardy in, in any circumstances. Here's a few more little pieces of information. My friend didn't have his driver's license. I was the only one. I was still 17. I'd only just got my license. It was a, over a 4,000 kilometer trip over a short period of time. A bit foolhardy, perhaps. Also, my car. I went in my car, uh, which was a not so trusty old bomb, a classic first car, 
I'm sure you might have experiences of those yourselves. A two-wheel drive Mazda Capella, in my case, uh, not suited for outback tracks. Also, neither of us had climbing experience. So, to give you just one story from this trip, there was one day that we did what's classed as a grade five hike, scaling down cliffs into the pool at the bottom of the iconic Knox Gorge. Many of you will have seen that lookout. We went down knowing that it would actually be physically impossible to, for us to come back up out the way that we were going down, but we assumed that there'd be another way out somewhere rather than spending the rest of our lives at the bottom. Grade five hikes are, I quote, only for highly experienced, self-reliant hikers with specialised skills, specialised equipment, and for those carrying emergency first aid. Well, how did we fare on those stakes? No climbing experience, no climbing equipment, not even a Band-Aid, not even a drink bottle between us. There we were. Now, please don't get me wrong, this was fun. This was a lot of fun. I acknowledge, though, it was foolhardy. I also say that since marriage, I haven't been permitted to do anything like it again. <laughs> Are there foolhardy exploits in your past? Have you ever potentially triggered your guardian angel to have PTSD? <laughs> I reckon you have. My guess is that we've all got foolhardy exploits of the past. Why not share a few of them over coffee, morning tea today? That would be great. Here's a harder question. Are there any foolhardy exploits in your present? Things that demand a little more reflection. Um, uh, and if you're going to talk about that over coffee, it might require a bit more disclosure. Uh, if you're really game, why don't you do that as well today or perhaps during the week? Here is the main question, though, that I want us to ask today. Are we supposed to live the Christian, our Christian life with a foolhardy fervour? Just to get on and do it without thought. Well, let me put that in another way. Are we meant to live boldly, exuberantly, with a youthful, foolhardy, can-do mentality, without thinking of any consequences, without contemplating the implications of what we're doing? A Christian's meant to set outrageously ambitious goals to glorify God, assuming nothing could possibly go wrong because God would protect us, wouldn't he, if we're doing something for God? Well, putting it that way sounds a bit crazy, doesn't it? Well, I hope it sounds at least a little bit crazy. Yet sometimes we can act or we can feel as though we ought to act that way as believers, we, that we ought to be outrageously bold and ambitious and not thoughtful at all as to the consequences of our actions. Some, someone's coined this as a, as, a, as a phrase, that we're meant to be living the barg kind of way, BARG standing for B-H-A-G, what's that? Big, hairy, audacious goals are to define us. The, the BARG way to live is forever chasing these big, hairy, these showy, glitzy, bold, audacious goals. BARG thinking normally happens without much contemplation of the cost and it uh, doesn't give attention to the planning that's needed or doesn't really focus on the long haul. Indeed, it doesn't always, in fact, it rarely even thinks about whether the goals are best in the long term anyway. Are we to live our Christian life making the biggest, glitziest splash that we can without investing at all in thinking as to what we're doing and what the consequences are? Is that lapsadaisical approach to, to living our faith, is that what God calls us to? I mean, God does call us to be bold, don't get me wrong. Well, in Ephesians 5, the passage that was just read out, Paul spells out some bold, worthy aspirations for us. We're to be refined and shaped by this. There's nothing thoughtless in this passage. Paul urges us, believers of all ages, to become imitators of God. That's the beginning, chapter 5, verse 1. For follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Wow, what a high benchmark. Follow God's example. Walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I do, I do not want us to not see the importance of being like Christ in that boldness, that self-sacrificial living. There is nothing lapsadaisical, accidental, thoughtless about a life that's imitating Christ. There is costly sacrifice for others. 
And that only can happen with disciplined intentionality. But Paul gives us so much more information to shape us. Paul hammers home the the same truth in verse 8. For you once were in darkness, but now you're in light. Live as children of light. A radical difference between dark and light. There's so much richness to this that we're just bouncing over at the moment. A command to live in a way that's not natural for our sinful being. And Paul has big ambitions for the Christian walk. And it's right for us to consider how these aspirations should play out in our lives. It is good to have ambitious goals. But as we do, we mustn't be naive or unprepared. Because Paul doesn't just lay out the ambitions and leave us there. He gives us so much direction as to how we are to shape those ambitions. So please look with me again at verse 15. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. These these verses are full of important advice, wisdom, teaching to shape us as we live our Christian lives. We're to walk the Christian walk in a certain way. Be very careful, Paul says. He's saying this to you and to me by by God's Spirit. Watch carefully how you walk. That, That word carefully there is a word for accuracy and precision. It means be exact and meticulous of where you do and don't walk, how you walk. It means, it means living the Christian life. It's not just about having these big goals and dreams and plans that we can cook up and that sound cool. It's about the details. It's about making sure that we're taking the care that God has called us to, to take about our Christian walk, looking out, paying attention Looking at others, how can we be Christ-like in this context? How can we speak the truth of God? How can we live the truth of God? How can we be Jesus in this context? We're to walk wisely, which means we live out our, live, our Christian lives in, in a, in not as the unwise would, but as wise would. What does it mean to be wise? Wisdom in the Bible, it's, it's, it's not an intellectual thing. It's a, it's a good and right application of what we know. It means understanding the shape of God's world and then living rightly in the light of that truth. So in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul talks about wisdom involving understanding the true shape of the social order under God, living appropriately. The wise person doesn't live for factions, for power plays, for themselves, but for Christ and Christ crucified. And here in in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, wisdom is about understanding the shape of God's world in the broadest, most cosmic sense. The wise person understands who rules the world, what the world is really like, and where the world is heading. The days we live in are evil. Paul said it back then, 2,000 years ago. It's equally true now. It's not more true, it's not less true, it's the same. We live in a world where there is very open rebellion against God. Our days are evil. Our context involves Satan himself raging against God and his people. But his rebellion is temporary, is passing away. The truly wise person will not follow what the world calls wisdom. We will follow what God calls wisdom because that's not temporary, it's not passing away. The truly wise person will not get caught up in pleasure or sensualities, which is so easily able to ambush all of us, chasing after our personal comfort or advancement or career. Rather, the wise person will understand that the world is Christ-shaped in the biggest, most important sense, will live appropriately, making the most of the kingdom opportunities that surround every one of us. This, this phrase translated as making the most of in the NIV, if you've got a different translation, I might say redeeming the time. It's a, it's a commercial phrase, buying back something that's been lost so that we can positively use it, making the most of it. That's what we Christians are to do with what? Well, with everything, but here it's applied specifically to time. The time that we live in this world. We live in a time that's been described here as being lost. 
because the air that we breathe is tainted by a rampant disobedience to God. Our context is the godlessness and the hopelessness that Paul reveals that we've been saved from. And so earlier in Ephesians, in Ephesians 2, verses 12 and 13, Paul says to us, remember that at that time, this is before you were believers, before you knew Jesus, remember at that time you were excluded from citizenship in heaven, citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. You were without hope, without God in the world. But now, Christ Jesus, you were once far away, but now you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. This, this is a, a magnificent truth. What you were is radically different to what you are now. What you are now is radically better, infinitely better for all eternity. What joy there is in who we are now. And we need to reclaim the lost time in this world to help others to meet Jesus, to know that joy, and to be changed for all eternity. And not be captivated by the futile, evil purposes of our world. And, and who is to live like this? We, us, all who have met Jesus. This is for all of us, not just some. Our attitude to the world that we're in is to make the most of these evil days to spend the time that we've had been given for the purposes of God, for his plans. We're not to love and be captivated by the things of the world or spend our time blindly pursuing the things of the world. We're to enjoy them, but not to be captivated by them. It would be foolish to be waylaid by such temporary things. Rather, we ought to use the things of the world, including the time that every one of us has been given, for the glory of the Lord Jesus, for speaking the gospel, for living the gospel, for sharing the truth, for illustrating the truth, for journeying with people with Christ-like love and truth in all the multi-dimension wisdom that God has showered upon us. We need to be people with good time management skills. Not time management in the way that the world thinks of time management. The ultimate goal of our time management is not to get things done faster or more efficiently. It is to reclaim and use the time in this evil age that God has entrusted to you and to me for the glory of the Lord Jesus. And so it's worth asking ourselves serious questions about our time management. Are you wise? Am I wise? Let us each ask that. Am I wise in the way I use my time? I don't mean are you always busy doing Christian things. In fact, if, you're, if we're always ultra busy, if people ask us, how are you doing? And if our answer is always flat tack, ultra busy is probably a sign that we're not using our time as well as we ought to. The world trains us to be super busy. Our phones, our emails, our notifications, our schedules, they always want us to update them, to respond, to be on call, to be distracted. And if we've got a spare moment, the world always wants us to overuse that in leisure. If we're always busy, we're not likely to be watching carefully how we walk. And therefore, we won't be making the use of the time that God has given us. So being ultra busy is not what Paul is talking about. Nor is being ultra chilled. Let's not go to the other side. When it comes to the use of our time, always being super chilled because we're aiming so low with what we do that we've always got plenty of spare time and relaxation. That's not Paul's goal either. It's not his life. Just look at his example. It wasn't that at all. This is what God's call is. Make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Dwell upon that. Yes, it's good to have big ambitious goals, but if all we have are big plans and dreams without carefully considering our faith and how to instill and grow faith in other people, we're not being wise with how we use our time. We're being foolish. This challenge is before us all. Am I wisely using the time that I have? Am I wisely using all that I have? Am I considering carefully how I live? For example, 
Here it gets practical. Are we deliberately praying first before anything? I mean, we're in spiritual warfare and God himself listens to our prayers and, and God's spirit is at work around us. We, we need to ask him to be at work. How futile it is to live as busy as we might be, as fruitful as we think we might be, if we're just doing it in our own strength. Let us be prayerful. It would be unwise to not be. I struggle with that. Why is it that most of us struggle with being prayerful like that? Uh, are you delib- deliberately making sure that you've got reasonable routines of sleep and rest as much as you can in your life stage? I definitely struggle a lot with that. Do you? Do you, under God, seek to control your life and your time, not letting pings and emails and notifications and tweets and TV and all sorts of other things stop you from loving and serving the Lord Jesus? Do you regularly review your walk with God and life in general so that you're shooting for the goals that God has made you for? Do you actually stop and spend time considering, reviewing, talking to others to help you to see the perspective of who you are and who you've become? Asking yourself how to put sin to death? Asking yourself how to, how to, how to make the most of the day that you have before you? What about, what about sexual purity? Are you actively doing that? Verse 3, we skipped over. But, but among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. This is an important contemplation. This is something to shape us all to live without a hint of sexual immorality. So let's come back to verse 15, our focus. Be very careful then how you live. Listen to God saying this to you. Be very careful in how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. God is telling us to be continually prioritizing the things that matter, not just the urgent things. And and that often means saying no to some things so that we can say yes to the best things that shape what we do for the kingdom. Paul continues, verse 17, therefore, that is, there's another logical implication of being careful in how we live so as to make the most of every opportunity that God has given us. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. God's will, his purpose, his plan for creation, it ultimately involves summing up everything in Christ. That's the will that God has disclosed to us and revealed to us. In Ephesians 1, verses 9 to 10, these great words, He, Jesus, made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Can you see? Right even at the beginning of Ephesians, we get this magnificent picture of where God is driving the world. And here now, close to the end, we're told our place in that, making the most of every opportunity that God has given us. Page after page, including in our focus today, Paul urges his readers to grasp God's will. Doesn't just mean for us to intellectually understand what God is doing. We've only grasped the will of God when it challenges and shapes our daily life. We haven't got it until it gets us. It gets our what we do. In other words, we haven't grasped God's will until God has grasped us and, and made a radical difference in our lives, a difference that we can see, that others can see, that make a difference in what we do, how we live, step by step, seeking to be careful in how we walk for the sake of the Lord Jesus. And of course, there's ages and stages of life where it will look different as to what we do, and we're not to feel guilty because we can't do now what we could do in the past. No, God has always got steps for us to further his will. A few years ago, I read a book 
uh, written by Christopher Ashe called Zeal Without Burnout. Um, it's a book that talks about the concept of sustainable sacrifice. Sustainable sacrifice, it, 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 it doesn't mean striking a balance to have a happy, stress-free life with just the right amount of serving God to keep God happy. Rather, maximising our sacrificial, Christ-like giving of ourselves for others and doing so over the long haul. It's, it's talking about the cross of Christ day by day for the years ahead, not burning out, none of us burning out, but continually being fruitful and productive in loving and serving the Lord Jesus in this evil world. Bearing the cross of Christ in a way that reveals the greatness of Christ for the long haul. How do we do that? Not, well, not by relaxing, not by running away from hard things. We do it by wisely, carefully thinking about taking control of our life whenever we can to bring it under the supremacy of Christ. We do so by watching carefully how we walk. And so, what a great question. Are you living with sustainable sacrifice? It's a question for us to ask. It's been such a pleasure, hasn't it, just to be able to hone in on these couple of verses, these three verses, Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. I encourage us to keep on meditating upon these truths from God's Word. To that end, I've set you some homework. Yes, you just heard it. In your newswaves outline, there's three pointy questions for further reflection. They're in the outline so that you can take them, so that you can read them. What changes in your life would result from a growth in wisdom? Ask yourself that day by day this week and beyond. How does knowing that the days are evil cause you to make the most of every opportunity? Reflect on that and be shaped by what God reveals to you. How will you respond better today, this week, this year, this life, to knowing what the Lord's will is? How will you respond better to that? And as you reflect on these things, as I encourage you to do so, there's nothing foolhardy about how we're to engage with the reality people around us who don't trust in Jesus are going to a Christless eternity. Therefore, we are to make the most of every opportunity. We're to live wisely. The stakes could not be higher. This homework, this reflection, thinking through those three verses afresh, verses 15, 16 and 17, and keeping on being shaped by them, that is an immense blessing from God. For God has given us time to shape others for eternity. It is that important. Before we close, I've just got one more question. One more tangent. I could say a tangent because there's so many different directions we can go with, with these truths as we apply them. I just want to apply them in just one area. Here's the question. What are the implications of Ephesians 5, 15 to 17 when it comes to North Beach Baptist Church planting a new church? What are the implications? If you're in a growth group over this last week, most of our growth groups have studied this passage in the light of that kind of question. There are many implications, aren't there? Implications that leap out of this very text. Firstly, we will see church planting as an opportunity to be made the most of because the days are evil. It's an evangelistic and discipleship opportunity. There's, there's, there's a darkness to be combated with the truth, with the light. There's a candle to be put on a hill in a place which doesn't have candles or has very few candles in a large place. And here's another implication. We're to be careful, careful in how we engage with that opportunity. Careful how? Well, careful to be God-honoring. What does that mean? Careful with the truth. We must be careful that we teach the truth, not some distortion of the truth. But, but the truth of God. And we must be careful how we live in the light of that so the truth and love are in harmony. That they're the defining marks of a church plant as they're to be the defining marks of us here in North Beach and us in our workplace and our home life. Truth and love must be fair, square and centre. And although there are millions more implications 
Just to mention one more, we will gladly live with the concept of sustainable sacrifice. It will be costly. There'll be all sorts of levels of cost in a, in a church plant, including hard work, including tough times, including all sorts of challenges. But that's what we're called to. We, we're called to gladly live with the concept of sustainable sacrifice. We won't be thinking about ourselves. We'll be thinking about what God has made us for and how we can, how we can be faithful and fruitful in loving and serving our Lord Jesus. The passage we've looked at has direct implication to church planting, to church life, to our life. May we be shaped by the truth of God's word in ways that cause others to grow in things of God as we grow in things of God. Let's come together and let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this super helpful, super clear teaching from your word. We come before you to eagerly be renewed, refreshed, refined and refocused in a, in a life of sustainable sacrifice where you are exalted, where we live in the light of your greatness and shine forth your truth with joy, carefully and continually. And we pray this in your precious name. Amen.